Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to look at the period of time from Malachi to Matthew as we continue our introduction to our survey of the Old Testament. Per we start with the Persian Empire. Remember that the Persians were the empire that was in control as our Old Testament comes to, a contr comes to an end. And within a hundred years, the Persian Empire itself would come crashing down. The Persian Empire was the largest empire that the world had seen up to this point, stretching from the borders of Greece in the in the west and and uh, taking in Egypt all the way to the Hindu Kush and to the borders of India. It was Alexander the Great, this uh, young uh, king who came to the throne in his early twenties, who would, within the space of ten years, bring the Persian Empire to an end. There's a mosaic in, uh, that was found in the ruins of Pompeii today. It's in the Naples Museum, uh, and it pictures the epic battle of Alexander against King Darius of Persia. Uh, it was three such battles that, that cumulative, uh, um, he won each one of those, and at the end of that time, the, the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire had come to an end. Josephus tells one story about Alexander as he was marching down the Levant. Uh, each city to which he would come would open their doors. He would uh, come in. He'd say, recognize me as king, and you can go about your business. And, and nearly every city did that. Tyre was a notable exception. And he was uh, besieging Gaza and sent some troops up to Jerusalem. And the doors were shut in their face. They were not allowed to enter the city. And, of course, that meant that, uh, from Alexander's point of view, he was going to destroy the city. And so Josephus tells the story about how Alexander sent some troops to, to besiege and capture Jerusalem and slaughter the inhabitants. And the high priest of the city went out with a number of the other priests to meet him uh, as he came up to Jerusalem. And Josephus uh, said they had with him a copy of the book of Daniel. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, that was, was showed to Alexander, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that he himself was the person intended, and he was then glad. And so Alexander was so impressed by this that the Hebrew scriptures talked about a Greek king who would conquer Persia, that he said, well, you guys can go ahead about your business. And, and he gave the... Uh, he treated the Jews well and gave them a certain amount of autonomy. Of course, they had to pay taxes to him, uh, but that was par for the course. Alexander continues on into Egypt. In Egypt, he is crowned as the pharaoh, uh, even takes a, a trip out to the, uh, to the Siwa Oasis, way out on the borders of Libya. It was no strong, small affair. So here's Alexander. He's moved through Turkey, moved down through the Levant to Egypt. I mentioned he all, went all the way to, to the Siwa Oasis. Egypt becomes his uh, without any really too much in the way of fighting. Then he turns back and marches across Mesopotamia and into Persia, uh, captures the city of Persepolis, the Persian capital, uh, burns it to the ground. Um, he Fight, he's fought Darius now several times, and, and the Persian Empire is now his. But he continues on to the east, to the Hindu Kush, and all the way into India over the next several years. Um, and only turns back when his men say, please, we don't want to go any further. And, and they basically revolt again. They, they, they stage a sit-down strike, and, and he says, come on, let's go. And, and they won't, and finally he agrees to turn, it, turn back. And he comes back to Babylon. Now, the world of Alexander... Uh, he had brought about a cultural interchange from east to west. Uh, if you wanted to talk to Alexander, you basically had to learn his language. And so uh, Greek now is going to become the common language of the entire civilized world. What's more, he brings a great deal of scientific interchange uh, as he uh, goes upon his march of, of conquest. He has with him scientists and observers, and um, remember his 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 uh, tutor when he was growing up had been Aristotle, and so he was well versed in science and interested in these sorts of things. Uh, Hellenization, and by this I mean now the word Hellenization just means uh, we could call it Greekization. Because uh, Hellas is just the Greek word for Greece. We, they don't call their country Greece. We call it that. 
Uh, so Hellenization, that is the Greek influence, not just of the language, but of the culture now began to be felt throughout the ancient world as a result of Alexander's conquest. Uh, as we said, the Greek language uh, also become, becomes the common language. As a result, our New Testament, all of uh, the earliest copies of our New Testament are not written in Aramaic or Hebrew. They are written in Greek. Alexander finally died. He was about 33 years old. And as he lay on his deathbed, as he lay on his deathbed, his soldiers gathered around and asked, to whom do you give your kingdom? And he whispered out, to the strongest. Leaving no male heir, this meant that there would be a power grab to see who could take what from his kingdom. There were a, a number of generals that each grabbed a portion. Ptolemy uh, grabbed Egypt, Perdiccas grabbed Mesopotamia, Antigonus the one-eyed, uh, what we call Anatolia or modern-day Turkey, Lysimachus took uh, Thrace, Cassander took uh, Macedonia, um, but this didn't. Uh, this this wasn't going to pan out as the sort of a long-term solution. Uh, Perdiccas, he comes up against Ptolemy, tries to take Egypt, and he is destroyed. And then the other kings all team up against Antigonus, the one-eyed. They march against Antigonus. They defeat him. And now this doesn't happen overnight. This is over the space of twenty or thirty years. Um, and when the dust settles. The new ruler of, um, of Anatolia and Mesopotamia will be Seleucus. And he and his descendants, now Seleucus is one of Ptolemy's subgenerals initially, uh, but instead of giving the property back to Ptolemy, Seleucus sets it himself up and his descendants as the new ruler. So you have Greek rulers now in Egypt and in Mesopotamia and in, of course, Thrace and Greece. You would expect to see Greek rulers there. Uh, but these are all Greek rulers. In fact, Ptolemy is uh, Ptolemy, and they'll be the first, the second, the third, all the way down to the twelfth. Uh, every one of those, every one of the Ptolemies will be Egyptian. The last of the Ptolemies that will we we shall see will be a, a young gal by the name of Cleopatra, but she will be Greek. And with the exception of Cleopatra, none of the Ptolemies ever even learned to speak Egyptian. They're all speaking Greek. Likewise, the Seleucids, now they, they won't all be named Seleucus. Sometimes we'll see another name, but it will be his descendants that will be ruling for the next 100, 150, 200 years or so. Ptolemy, the second of the Ptolemies, Ptolemy Philadelphus, is interesting to us because he, first of all, he builds the Pharos lighthouse, uh, a lighthouse uh, near Alexandria, which became one of the wonders of the world. You can, it's said that you could see its light from uh, 50 miles away. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but that's, that's how the story is told. Uh, he also builds a library at Alexandria. Um, I've been in the modern-day library of Alexandria and never been in the, in the ancient one. It was, it's long since been destroyed. And it, too, was one of the wonders of the world. Um, and Ptolemy Philadelphia set out to have copies of every book in the world in his library and one of the books that he wanted for his library was the Hebrew scriptures however he couldn't read Hebrew he couldn't even read Egyptian and he was ruling over Egypt and so an order went out for the Hebrew scriptures to be translated into Greek and that translation took place now it's known as the Septuagint the Septuagint means the Septus means 70 and the story goes that there were 70 translators who worked on this project um, but what they did is they translated the entire Old Testament Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And we still have copies of the Greek translation. Like I said, it's known as the Septuagint. It wasn't long before the Ptolemies and the Seleucids were at war one with another. And this was going to be the pattern for the next hundred years or so. So we have Seleucus in the north, the Ptolemies in the south, and their descendants in each case with little tiny Israel sitting in the middle, and first Israel would be a property of, of the Ptolemies, and then the Seleucids would come down, and, and for a time Israel would be the property of, of the Seleucids. So you're going to have Israel feeling a little bit like a ping pong ball between these two rivals. Finally, Antiochus III, he's the, one of the Seleucid kings. He's also known as Antiochus the Great because I guess it doesn't get much better than him. He marches all the way to India, just like Alexander had, uh, stocks up on his store of war elephants, among other things, 
And he took, takes Judah from Ptolemy, as, as I said, it had been bouncing back and forth. Uh, but he loses in a battle to Ptolemy at the Battle of Raphia, so he is still unable to do that final conquest over Egypt. And he is host to Hannibal. Remember, Hannibal was the great enemy, not of the Ptolemies, but of Rome, which tells me that Rome is now entering the picture. And after ha Hannibal had lost to the Romans, uh, Hannibal came to the east and uh, found refuge with Antiochus III, which is not going to put him on the same side as the Romans. So Antiochus III and the Romans, uh, they uh, enter into battle, and Antiochus III loses to the Romans, and as a a part of the loss, his son is taken as a captive back to Rome. He'll be a hostage. Now, that doesn't mean he's put into prison. He's, he goes to school there and probably has a roommate and things like that. Um, but his, his son is in Rome. Now, after Antiochus III dies, his son, Antiochus IV, he's also known as Antiochus Epiphanes. That means Antiochus the Magnificent, although the Jews had a different nickname for him. They called him Antiochus Epimenes, which meant Antiochus the Madman. And that's going to tell you his, his relationship with the Jewish people. Well, as we, we had the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, and Antiochus IV, when his father dies, he escapes from Rome and he comes back to his to take up the throne of the Seleucids. He's been a hostage there in Rome, but now he makes his escape, and he comes back, takes up the crown, and he decides he's going to be another Alexander. He comes down to Judah. He doesn't really care for the things that are going on in there. He says, uh, you know, I, I want a more Greek-friendly uh governor and you know they don't really have governors so much in Judah as, as much as they would have a high priest so he deposes the high priest and he puts a high priest who will be a little bit more Greek in his thinking which does not endear him at all to the Jews next he invades Egypt he decides I want to be another Alexander the Great and so uh, I'll do what dad could not do I will come down against Ptolemy and this time he comes down and he wins and he wins big uh, and he has Ptolemy bottled up in, in uh, the last city. It's about to fall. Uh, when all of a sudden, coming out from the city is a Roman magistrate, all by himself. And, and Antiochus says, well, what's this? It, it's actually an acquaintance of his that he had met back in Rome. And this magistrate walks up to him and says, the Senate and the people of Rome want you out of Egypt. Go home. And Antiochus has actually been to Rome. He has a high regard for Rome and for the power of Rome. And so he's a bit intimidated. But he says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll think about it. And the, the magistrate says, you can think about all you want. Draws a circle around him on the sand and says, give me your answer before you step out of that circle. Now, Antiochus is thoroughly humiliated, but he knows better than to go up against Rome. And so he agrees to leave. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, word has gotten back that Antiochus had died in Egypt. Now, it wasn't true. It was just a false rumor. You know how you have false rumors on the Internet today. They had them back then as well. And Antiochus arrives in Jerusalem, and he's very much alive. And he's angry at the Jewish celebration over his death. Uh, and he comes in, and he imposes the following regulations. The Jews are no longer allowed to assemble for prayer. Uh, observance of the Sabbath is now forbidden. Possession of the scriptures are illegal. It's illegal to even own a copy of the scriptures. Circumcision of male children is, are, is now illegal. Circumcision is illegal. And the observance to dietary laws is now illegal. In fact, uh, Antiochus goes into the temple and has a pig killed upon the altar and orders everybody sacrifice and, and eat up. Uh, he has a statue of Zeus placed into the temple. In fact, and, and nobody knows what Zeus looked like, so they, the, those that made the statue make him look like Antiochus. It actually looks like a statue of Antiochus standing in the temple. Everybody's supposed to worship that now. The, these pagan sacrifices are now mandated. And this continues for a number of months until finally uh, his officials are in a little town called Modin 
and they are seeking to impose uh, these restrictions, these these pagan sacrifices, and a elderly priest, Matthias, and his sons are in that town, and they institute a re revolt. They're, we're going to call it the Maccabean Revolt, named after the one of those sons. Now, he's not the oldest, but he's the sort of the leader of the group. His name is Judas, but he gets the nickname Maccabeus, because the word Maccabeus means hammer, and he really puts the hammer to the Seleucids. So the Maccabean Revolt breaks out, and finally by 166 BC, they are able to retake Jerusalem, and they recapture the temple. The temple is finally liberated. It is cleansed. Uh, they, you know, all the pigs are taken away, and and there's a cleansing of the temple as the people return to the Lord. That celebration continues to be observed even today. We call it the Festival of Lights or the Feast of Hanukkah. Now Judas was the initial leader, but after he he eventually dies in battle. And so it will be one of his brothers, Simon, who becomes the new leader. They're not calling them themselves kings. These are a, a family of priests. But eventually they are going to take the role of high priests. And Judah is recognized as a free state in the year 142 B.C. It's Rome that recognizes uh, Judah at first. Um, but eventually everybody else does. And, and so Judah has gained her independence. As we said... Uh, and this family, Simon in particular, eventually takes the role of high priest. He's uh, you know, sort of the ruler. They don't really have kings yet, although eventually they're going to take the title of king as well. Simon reigns until he is murdered by his son-in-law. And, oop, we already read that. He's murdered by his son-in-law. And now we're going to see the emergence of two new Jewish parties. First of all, they are the Hasidim, the pious ones. They are reflected in those who said, we wouldn't turn and worship those false gods. We wouldn't eat the, those things that were wrong. In fact, uh, we don't care for the way that there's a certain Greek thinking that's beginning to seep into our culture. We're going to, to remain free of that. And this group will eventually become known as the Pharisees of New Testament era. So we have the Hasidim on the one side. You have what we could call, only call the Hellenists. Now these aren't Greeks, but they're Greek thinkers. They're Greek thinking Jews who have been influenced by that Greek thinking. And these seem to be characterized by the Sadducees of a later age. The Sadducees, now they would have uh, been shocked to hear themselves described as coming under Greek influence. I'm not sure if they they thought of themselves that way. But we see them adopting uh, both uh, Greek ideas and Greek philosophies and uh, Greek ways of looking even at their own scriptures. We have Simon who passes the, uh, the leadership, can't call it a throne yet, down to John Hyrcanus. By this time, you are beginning to call them kings. He has two sons, uh, and uh, Aristobulus, he becomes the high priest and king, um, but he's Im he imprisons his brother, uh, you know, actually all of his brothers and his mother, thinking that they might try to usurp his authority. Uh, and so you can see the families aren't getting along very well, even though this is a priestly family. Finally, we get to the point where the two brothers are each fighting over the throne. And meanwhile, there's a Roman general in the neighborhood. Pompey the Great had been commissioned by the Romans to clear the seas of piracy. Um, he had uh, done that within the space of three months and still had plenty of time on his uh, rolls to do something further. And so he came to Syria and he was had been conquering there. And these two brothers, these two uh, Maccabean, I'm going to call them by their family name, the Hasmonean brothers, uh, both sent word to Pompey saying, will you please come and get rid of this brother of mine? And he says, oh, okay. And he comes down and he takes Jerusalem in the year 63 B.C. From now on, Jerusalem 
and Judah will know, in fact, he actually changes the name. Instead of being called Judah, it will now be called Judea, and it will become a Roman province. So I have Judea, that part that used to be Judah. To the north there will be a separate province known as Samaria, because there's a different people group. These are, are folk that have intermarried with some of the uh, resident Jewish people living there to, to be sort of a, I guess we could only call them sort of a half-breed. And then there are ten cities to the east of the Jordan River, and the way you say that in Greek, uh, Apollos is a city, and Deca is Latin or Greek for for the idea of ten, so the Decapolis it refers to those, the, the area of those ten cities, ten Greek cities. Now, eventually we get to the point where Pompey, and his, who was originally his partner, Julius Caesar, uh, they have a falling out, and they're going to plunge the Roman Empire into civil war. Uh, the Battle of Pharsalus is where this is settled in Greece. Uh, both Caesar and Pompey, and it is Pompey, remember that he's the one who had come and taken Jerusalem, and he had set up some certain arrangements, but he's, he is defeated. He runs down to Egypt where he is uh, he's put to death, and now Julius Caesar becomes virtually the ruler of the world. That's only going to last a handful of years, and then Caesar himself will be assassinated. Meanwhile, what's happened in, in Judea? We have a Idumean by the name of Antipater who had been appointed first by Pompey but now Pompey is defeated and this is affirmed by Julius Caesar Antipater who is going to be the procurator. A procurator is one whose job is to procure the taxes so we could call him a glorified tax collector over both Judah and Samaria and the Decapolis. And Antipater takes two of his sons and places them in positions of authority. First, Faisal, uh, his older son, is placed in authority over Judea. And then his younger son, by the name of Herod, is placed in authority over Galilee to the north. That lasts until about 40 BC. This, now, by this time, Julius Caesar has been killed and, and other things are going to take place that we'll talk about in just a moment. But the Jews revolt, and they seem to get, according to some reports, they get some, some help from the east. A group known as the Parthians come and help with, in, in rousting not only Antipater, actually Antipater's already died, Faisal is captured and killed, and Herod actually has to battle his way out, comes down to uh, Jerusalem, and just south of Jerusalem, about f uh, five miles or so, uh, right near Bethlehem. He fights a, uh, a, a retreating battle. He manages to escape. He gets down to Petra, and from there gets um, uh, makes his way to Egypt, and then finally to Rome. And in Rome, he finds uh, two patrons. One is Octavius, the the adopted son, actually nephew of Julius Caesar, but in in his will he had been adopted. Uh, so Octavius, and also one of Julius Caesar's o old generals, Marcus Antonio, we know him as Mark Antony. And it's Mark Antony in particular that takes Herod under his wing, and they these two bring Herod before the Senate of Rome, and the Senate of Rome pronounces Herod to be the new king of the Jews. However, he's a king without a kingdom. He's just been driven off by the Jews, and of course the Parthians too. Uh, so he is sent back to to Israel to recapture the country of Israel for Rome and for himself because he's going to be their new king. Uh, he will be their client king as he recaptures Israel. Uh, we'll, we'll get to Cleopatra in a bit. She's, uh, she had, and Herod had had a meeting. Cleopatra always uh, wanted to have uh, Judah and Israel for her own possession. And at one point, Mark Antonio Marcus Antony, uh, Mark Antony actually sounds like he's going to give it to her and, and make some promises to her. Uh, she really never does get her hands on it. Now, Herod the Great, as, I, as we said, 40 BC, he is pronounced king of the Jews. However, it's going to take him three years to get the kingdom back. So it's not until 37 BC that he actually starts to reign back in Israel uh, now that he's captured uh, the kingdom back for Rome. 
among other things of Herod's projects, well, he's going to start a number of different building projects. One of those will be the temple. Now we have a picture here of Zerubbabel's temple, after that, how it had been rebuilt after coming back into the land in the days of the Persians. It had seen some modifications in the days of the Seleucids. Again, some modifications in the days of the Hasmonean expansion. But Herod now takes that and he's going to to vastly expand, he will vastly expand the temple into the uh, this you know both to the north. There's going to be a fortress that he will build. In fact, he'll name it after his client uh, Marcus Antonius. It's going to be called the Antonia Fortress. He will build the royal stoa in the south here on the right hand side of our screen. Uh, that will be known as uh, Solomon's Porch. In fact, Solomon's Porch area will extend uh, completely around this area. He'll have a series of gates and bridges leading up to the Temple Mount. So he, he greatly expands uh, upon that. As we said, uh, the Antonia Fortress actually comes into play in uh, the book of Acts when later on when the Apostle Paul uh, is, is arrested in the Temple and brought up to the Antonia Fortress to, to have a hearing before the Roman centurion. There's a model uh, that you can see of what it would have looked like in that day. So the temple was a, a, a huge affair. Uh, notice that it had all of these surrounding walls. Now the temple itself is just that big structure right smack in the middle. But around it there are courts of the priests and of the men and courts of the women. Uh, and then there was a low boundary wall, a dividing wall, that separated that from the outer areas where only Gentile, you know, where Gentiles were allowed to come. Gentiles were not allowed into the temple proper or even into any of the inner courts but they could come to what was called the Court of the Gentile uh, around these outer courts. Herod also built the Herodium. I mentioned uh, a battle that he fought near, near Bethlehem, uh, just outside of Bethlehem. In fact, you can see it from Bethlehem. This uh, sort of conical mountain, it, it looks like a volcano, but actually this is all man-made. It was a fortress uh, back in its day. It had some huge towers and and what you're looking at in the foreground are these pillars that surround a swimming pool that Herod had constructed. So it must have been quite lavish in his day. Here's an artist's conception of how the, the Herodium would have looked at in its heyday, you know, where you can see uh, one of the towers and then a cross section of one of the others. So aerial view. Now I didn't take this picture. I've never been up in a plane over this area, but uh, borrowed an aerial view of the uh, of the Herodium looking down into it. And again, another aerial view of the, the big swimming pool in the Herodium. There's a number of underground tunnels. In fact, this is very common for, from a great many cities uh, in the regions of Israel. Uh, the tunnels uh, oftentimes lead to the water sources, but also they can be used as a way of escape uh, and, and treasures, you know, different things could be found there. Uh, quite fascinating to go not just into the area of Israel, but under the areas of Israel. Another of Her Herod's fortresses was the great fortress at Masada. Now this is by the shores of the Dead Sea. Uh, and the Masada itself is just a natural fortress where the wall, the, the mountain just goes straight up and then there's this big level area uh, on the top and yet Herod takes this and he builds a great palace. Here's from the other side of Masada where you can see the different fortifications and palace structures. Still another, another view of Masada. Israel did not possess any natural harbors, and so Herod had one constructed. He named it after Julius Caesar, his, one of his patrons, and so it was called Caesarea. Um, there's a couple of Caesareas mentioned in the Bible. There's a, another Caesarea called Caesarea Philippi. That's not this place. This is Caesarea Maritamia, that is Caesarea by the ocean. And this big breakwater allowed ships to come in and be sheltered from the storms. But it was more than just a breakwater. Uh, it was a vast city. This became the seat of the government. So big breakwater on the city. To do that, he sunk great stones. Uh, uh, scholars are still trying to figure out exactly how he managed such a engineering feat.
there is today at the at the ruins of Caesarea the theater of of Herod that he built there it is still used today they they have regularly uh, outdoor concerts that that meet there and and uh, wonderful acoustics uh, that allow one to stand in the middle of that theater and speak and everybody around is able to hear there were no natural water sources no spring waters at Caesarea and so water had to be piped in and it came via three aqueducts bringing water from as many as 9, 10, 12 miles away. Now, it wasn't long before Herod began to have some domestic troubles. In particular, he had a number of wives, all, always one at a time. But one of the things he did to try to legitimize himself is he married Mariamne, the last of the Hasmonean rulers, the last of the Maccabean rulers, and had two sons by her. It has been said that Herod, um, one of his greatest mistakes was not just to marry Mary Amney, but to fall in love with her. Uh, it wasn't long before he began to find plots against his throne, usually aimed at removing him and putting one of those two sons upon the throne. And so eventually he murdered both of his sons by Mary Amney, murdered Mary Amney as well. Um, he had killed so many of his own sons that Octavius Augustus quipped, the Roman emperor quipped, it's better to be Herod's hus than to be Herod's huios. Now it's a little, uh, it, it works in, in Greek, not as much as in English, but what we're saying there, it's better to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son, because uh, Herod would, would observe the dietary laws, but he gobbled up his own sons. After the death of Herod, uh, his son Archelaus, one of his surviving sons, I have to say, um, is on the throne for just a brief time until a petition from the Jews at Rome it, it is so evident and, and uh, he's mismanaged things so bad that he's removed from the throne by the Romans. And from now on, Israel, at least for a number of years, will be ruled by a series of either procurators or prefects, that is, Roman governors, Roman officials. Meanwhile, one of Herod's, another of Herod's surviving sons, Herod Antipas, is, is granted a tetrarchy, that is, a tetrarchy means a ruler of a fourth part, and he will be over Galilee, that is the area around the Sea of Galilee, and Perea, that's the area just to the east of the Jordan River, down around the Dead Sea. Uh, he's made a tetrarch, a ruler of a fourth part, um, and we're, we're told not only in Josephus, but we even read about this in the New Testament, that he uh, has an affair with one of his nieces by the name of Herodias. Now, to get the family line, we have to, to go back and look at Herod the Great. As I said, Herod the Great had a number of wives. Can't put them all here. They won't fit. Uh, but we mentioned uh, how he had married Mariamne and had the two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, who, both of who were put to death by Herod, but they had children who survived. And so we also, we mentioned Archelaus already, who rules for a short time before he's removed. And Antipas, Herod Antipas, they all like to call themselves Herod because he was the, the great. Uh, so Antipas becomes the tetrarch. Um, and he takes up with his niece, uh, Herodias, even though she's married to a, another of the sons of Herod. He's, she is married to Philip. Uh, another son by she's married to her half brother Philip but she leaves her husband and she goes and takes up with Antipas um, even though she's been married in fact she even has a daughter and it's that um, that affair against which John the Baptist preaches and says you know it's just not right for you to have your brother's wife and as a result John the Baptist is arrested and remember he is uh, even executed at the urging of Herodias uh, after her daughter. Now, her daughter's not mentioned in the Bible, but her name is given in Josephus uh, Salome. Uh, after Salome, you know, dances for, for Antipas, and, and Antipas says, well, what do you want? And, and Salome, this daughter of Herodias, says, well, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Uh, just to continue our New Testament look, we're going to see Agrippa I. He will be mentioned in Acts, and we, we see his death in Acts chapter 12 and 
during his time, this is a generation later, he will actually be for a short time king of the Jews again where there won't be any procurators but then he dies his death is described in Acts chapter 12 after he had put James to death uh, and and then after that uh, Israel will will again be under the various uh, procurators so we have Antipas and Herodias um, also uh, we just mentioned John the Baptist he is put to death uh, during the uh, during this period and that's actually described in several of the Gospels Antip Antip Antipater later on is going to be accused of uh, of doing some things politically incorrect. Uh, he will find himself back in Rome, uh, and he will be questioned as to some of his actions. And in particular, he has uh, been storing up uh, weaponry, and and that sounds like he's going to revolt against. Uh, against uh, Rome. I'm not sure if he was really planning on that, but he will be banished and Herodias will go along with him in his banishment and he will be banished to Gaul where he disappears from the pages of history. Now I want to talk in our closing uh, moments about the Pharisees versus the Sadducees because these are the two groups with whom Jesus deals quite extensively. The Pharisees, the term describes the separated ones. Remember, we described those as the Hasidim, who really didn't want anything to do with the Greek culture. Uh, these, uh, they had separated themsel themselves from that sort of I those sorts of ideas. Over against the Sadducees, who, now the term means the righteous ones. I'm not sure how righteous they were, um, but that's how they, that's at least what the name meant. The Pharisees held to the authority of the entire Old Testament as well as to the oral law, in contrast to the Sadducees who viewed only the Torah as having great authority. They, they said, well, the rest of the Old Testament, those are nice books, but they don't really have that much in the way of authority over us. So they rejected some of the teachings of those other books, for example, the resurrection that's tied in, in Daniel chapter 12. The Sadducees you know, had no use for that sort of teaching. The Pharisees believed in miracles, angels, immortality, these things that are mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. The Sadducees rejected miracles, angels, immortality, when you're dead, you're dead. Um, that, that's very Greek in their thinking. The Pharisees believed in a future resurrection. The Sadducees denied any life after death. The Pharisees were very popular in the synagogues. Now, that didn't mean everybody was a Pharisee. Far from it. The Pharisees were actually a, a fairly small group but they were they had a good deal of popularity by contrast the sadducees tended to rule in the temple they were on the supreme court and and they had all of the uh the big roles within the temple now most jewish people would not fit into either one of these camps um we could describe the pharisees as the ones that were very stringent the sadducees you know were a more of a um I don't want to call them a social club because that's not really fair to them. Um, they pictured themselves as we're the old guard. We hold to just the Torah. Um, but in reality, most people uh, might have been influenced by one group or the other, but most, the greater majority were somewhere in the middle. There were some other sects we ought to mention. We've already described the Pharisees as the Separatists, the Sadducees as the Liberal Party. There was also the Essenes. Now, this was a very small group who, um, they didn't think the Pharisees went, went far enough in their separation, so they had physically separated themselves from the rest of the Jews, and they w became communal separatists. They actually go down by the shores of the Dead Sea, and they, they set up camp in places like Qumran, where they had their own communities. Uh, and then, finally, we had to mention the Zealots. Again, a small group, but these were the nationalists who they said, you know, the only way to really do good is just to get rid of Rome. We need a independent Israel, Israel down with Rome, down with all these procurators and anybody that's friendly to Rome. Uh, and it's interesting that, that one of the disciples of, of Jesus is actually known as Simon the Zealot. Uh, so Jesus draws his disciples from a variety of of religious background.